welcome to Dragon Bites, the paediatric podcast. I'm Stacey Harris. And I'm Asim Javed. For those of you new to Dragon Bites, we're a podcast made in Wales by paediatricians for anyone interested in child health. Our podcasts are going to cover a range of themes with a focus on a different topic every episode. The types of podcasts to expect from us include revision-based episodes aimed at those revising for their college exams or anyone who needs a bit of a refresher. These podcasts are going to be learner-led and we'll give you some details on how to request a podcast at the end. Other episodes will focus on reflections from paediatricians around Wales, interviews from grid uh, trainees and paediatric consultants, as well as discussions about research, teaching, leadership and hot topics in paediatrics. The list is endless. So, let's get to it. So for this episode, we'll be focusing on top tips for passing paediatric exams. We're going to focus on written exams, firstly. Uh, So we've collected a selection of top tips for passing exams from paediatric trainees in Wales. So (laughs) Stacey, so so you've got hold of a few of these top tips from the other trainees. Um, How how do people get started with getting revising for their exams? So I think a lot of people started to talk about organisation. Um, And they were saying that it's really important to start early and to think about when you when you book your exam. So think about booking study leave in advance, thinking about what you have on on in that year and when would be the best time for you to sit that exam. It's really important to set some time aside for it and sort of be ready not to have a life for a few weeks, especially for when you're doing your clinical exams. Yeah. And I guess there's a difference, isn't there, between starting early in community and starting early if you've got a really rough neonatal run, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. And then we thought about simple things. So it's so important to look after yourself while you're doing exams. Make sure you're eating well, you're sleeping well, and you're taking regular breaks. Yeah, I don't think you can underestimate that, actually. Like, just taking care of yourself and staying healthy. In fact, I found, like, just still going to the gym regularly kept my brain functioning to revise for the exams well. So I don't think you can underestimate how important it is to just do the simple things regularly, even though you've got an exam coming up. Yeah, I think it probably makes your time when you're actually revising a lot more efficient, really, doesn't it, Asim? Yeah. Um, And that was something that we um, talked about as well, is using your time effectively and being efficient so um, when I was doing my uh, both clinical and theory exams I had a a small child at home and it was really difficult to find quiet time at home to sort of sit down and revise so actually a lot the the time I had was commuting to and from work I had like about an hour commute um, each way so I had two hours a day just just me so I uh, used to try and listen to a lot of podcasts just around paediatric cases um, and I actually also used to uh, record myself um, sort of reading through books just to try and get it to stick a little bit. Um, and it worked for me. Did it. that not freak you out? I would hate <laughs> having to... Not, I love your voice, don't get me wrong. But if I had to listen to my own voice for like yeah, an I, hour... I, I hated it, but it, I just, it was just what worked. And yeah, I didn't have any other option really, to be honest. <laughs> well, that's definitely using time effectively, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> Um, so any other tips in terms of just getting yourself organised properly? So I suppose because we're, you know, we're often doing busy clinical exams, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Um, so trying to learn whilst you're on the job. So if you have a case, try and think about how that case might relate to your exam and what sort of things they might ask and like try and read around it and even like speak to consultants and like really you know, get down to it with, 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 the, with the case. So I think actually it's a really good idea to base it around your job and a, around a case because it'll probably stick a bit better and when you're trying to think of that answer in the exam you'll perhaps think about the case that you've related it to so then it'll be a bit yeah. more real you know it's infinitely easier to remember what to do when you've actually done it in a clinical scenario mm-hmm. than it is to remember what you do what to do because you've read it in a book that that's what you meant to do absolutely absolutely Awesome. I think that's all. I mean, that was the bulk of the advice we got in terms of getting organised, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. But there are loads of, hint, of hints and tips on like effective resources that we can all learn from. So what, what did they go through with you, Stacey? Um, so uh, they talked about um, making sure you look at the Royal College website. So they've got a really good exam uh, revision, you know, exam section page. 
um, which has all the syllabus so you can look at what you're supposed to be learning about mm. and they've got some practice papers and things like that and then you're going to talk about some uh, question banks and things yeah so I mean there are loads aren't there online I think for the for the majority of people nowadays the best way to get going with revising is through question banks just do loads and loads of practice questions so I think the two famous ones are um, past test and on examination. I think those are the ones I most frequently heard used. I've heard there are some other ones as well, like one, two, three, doc and past peds and stuff. I've not used them myself, but you know, extra questions are extra questions, so what's the harm? Um, but at the end of the day, passing these exams are all about pattern recognition, aren't they? So the more practice questions you do, the easier it is to recognize those patterns, right? Yeah, and um, I found that there was a lot of questions to go through. Mm. So again, being organised and like just get a question bank and just start doing them because you know that quite a lot of them have got uh, like a, a progress, haven't they? And you can yeah. you can do the questions again. So just just starting with doing loads of questions so that you can do the questions again. I think you you'll get a bit more of the pattern recognition then. I think exactly, and a couple of them come with an app. So what I was doing, similar to this revised stuff, when you see a case is once a case came up, I would set my app to just do, I, you see a cardiology case, you set it to do cardiology questions, you get a five minute break at some point, you just do one or two questions just to quiz yourself while, while you're going. It yeah. works really well. Keeps it fresh, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a really good idea, Matthew. When I was doing my um, applied clinical knowledge, I think I looked at, I, I got a sort of topic I just used to Google loads and loads of pictures and just look through them and, and it really, really, really helped. Exactly, yeah. Honestly, it's a resource we didn't have 15 years ago, <laughs> but it's made such a difference. Can you imagine 15 years ago where you couldn't just Google, I don't know, measles rash and just see every image of a measles rash in existence. You just had to rely on a textbook. Now we've got this amazing thing. I know we shouldn't name specific brand names, but it's true. It's what we all do, isn't it? <laughs> um, in fact, another good website for rashes, I remember, is dermnet.nz, oh, yeah. isn't there? That's yeah. really good for looking at rashes, and that gives you lots of good clinical information too. That's true. I've forgotten about that one. Yeah. yeah. I did look at that, and it was really, really good. What about actually sort of the actual exam? What, what advice do you have with regards to that? So, I mean, ge generic advice works really well. So, uh, so what a lot of our trainees were feeding back to us is, one, focus on your weak areas. I think we all, it's an easy thing to dodge, isn't it? Oh, there were so many things that I dodged for ages. And I knew I struggled with it and I found it hard. And yeah, I used to try and avoid it like that. But I realised you just got to do it and do it first. And then so you have time to do it again. Exactly. And the thing is, the exam board knows what our weak areas are and knows what bits we yeah. dodge. And so that's what they examine. Yeah, they They're do. Like, it came up all the time. Yeah. Exactly. Do you, do you struggle with renal? We're going to throw in 10 <laughs> renal questions for you. Yeah. Vitamin D, vitamin D uh, metabolism, or, or the sort of phosphate stuff, all that sort of stuff is my bugbear. It looks like it's bringing up a bit of PTSD with you. <laughs> But yeah, it's true, isn't it? You've got to focus in on the on these weak subjects because they are the common subject areas too, aren't they? It's all these things, your uh, metabolic disorders, your renal conditions, immunology, everything that your brain knows is going to be a struggle. Just fight the resistance to ignore it. You know, fight the urge to ignore it. Yeah, resist the urge to ignore it. <laughs> and just like crack on because the only way you're going to get your head around it is by cracking on. Yeah, yeah you're totally right. <clears throat> so um, what about exam question technique? Oh yeah, there was loads of really good advice about exam te question technique. So uh, one of my favourite things at the end of every exam, and I think this is what people do in general, but just in case you don't, is spend five minutes just checking your answers. In AKP in particular, there's one exam question type called N of many, um, where you get given a list of like 15 different answers and you've got to pick two or three of them. And that'll be the first type of question in all the exam papers where you're picking more than one answer. So it's really easy to fall into the habit of just clicking one answer every time. And then you miss the end of many, you put one answer down and then you move on. So that five minutes at the end where you just check your answers, make sure you've put down the right number of answers, make sure you haven't accidentally put down C when you meant D. You, you score more marks in that five minutes at the end than you do in any other block of five minutes in the exam. So it's if you don't do it, please do it. It will save yeah, you a lifetime. Simple, isn't it? But um, yeah, really good advice.
Absolutely. I think the other thing is when you are reviewing your results, there's going to be this temptation to second guess yourself. Have you ever had that? Oh, all the time. Exactly. Like there's a question you've put down, you're like convinced the answer's A, you've put down A, no question about it. You look back at it a few minutes later and you're like, maybe it's not. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I did that so much. But I think um, if you've had that gut feeling, just go with your gut feeling because it's probably most likely to be the right answer. Exactly. In fact, there have been studies about it, haven't there, that have proven that if you trust your gut feeling, you're more likely to be right. And people who change those answers afterwards are more often wrong. So just go with your gut on these sorts of things. Then there's a lot about how questions are set, and it's useful to know how these questions are set because you can kind of game the system slightly. Can you? Yeah. Um, So keep an eye out for things like answers that suggest a degree of certainty or an answer that's probably wrong. So if you get given a question like, which of the following is true? And one of the answers says one of the following phrases. So always, never, one of the above, all of the above. That that's committing too much certainty to the question. In medicine, we are very certainty averse, aren't we? Like yeah. there's nothing certain. Mm-hmm. So if if you, all things are equal and you really don't know what that answer is, I would go with the adage of anything that says always is wrong, because that's probably your best guess in that situation. However, if you know better, you know, go with it. Um, The other thing that you can also pick up just by going through the question is sometimes the grammar of the question will give away what answers are possible and what isn't possible just by the pronouns they're using and little tips. So just have a really good read through that question and see if you can rule out any of the answers just because the examiner wasn't thinking of that answer when they wrote the question. Mm -hmm. They were thinking of the correct answer. So they've written the question in a style that would give you the correct answer. And then they just filled in the blanks for wrong answers afterwards. And if you follow through the logic and the grammar, you can often just rule out an answer entirely. I mean, yeah, again, that's advice for when you're completely stuck and you've got no idea what to do. Just get rid of the grammar error answers. It works really well. Mm. I mean, they're only human. Things slip through the gaps. (laughs) So what about, you know, if um, if you're really struggling with exams? did you did you struggle with any exams? I oh yeah, um, I, pro- I, sh- I probably shouldn't say given that I'm giving it, um, advice, but I really struggled with AKP. It took me a couple of attempts to get through that one. And mm. um, what did you do to kind of get yourself through it? I, I think the main thing that helped was when I started revising that second time round. I was going through the questions to see what the questions actually meant. I think I'd fall into a habit of reading the questions and working on what I assumed they wanted me to answer. So like, this is a typical example of this. Um, You get a a typical question will end with the phrase, what's the next most important investigation? You've read the whole question, you've figured out what the diagnosis is. So in your head, you're thinking, oh, what they mean by that is what what investigation will give you the diagnosis. That's not what the question is asking you. It's asking you for the most important investigation. And you have to think of this in terms of clinical importance. If you've got If you figured out a diagnosis and there's a life-threatening association with it or a limb-threatening association with it, that's your most important investigation. That's what you want to rule out. So so knowing what the question actually means when it asks you something can make all the difference between passing and failing. So don't fall into tricks like I did. That cost me a paper or two. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so I really struggled with um, one of the theory exams as well. Um, I actually, it took me four attempts to do one of them, Massim. Um, <laughs> and um, yes. It's, well, you're significantly yeah. dumber than I <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> um, but yeah, of course, I went through, uh, you know, am I cut out for paediatrics? Obviously, I'm not good enough, all these things. Um, but what really got me through was um, when I sort of started to talk about it and talk to my registrar, my registrar colleagues who I sort of really respected and I found out that there a couple of them had also really struggled and had, and had had to take it quite a few times and things. And they just said, you will pass it in the end. Just keep going. Um, and that really meant a lot to me. And um, I think really sort of just gave me the um, confidence in myself, really, just to keep going at it. And, and I did pass it in the end and it was brilliant, you know. I think talking to your colleagues. So don't don't sit in you know in a room on your own and struggle and not tell anyone that you're struggling. I think just try and find help from you know registrar colleagues. Listen to things like this. 
um, and get um, an idea of what helped other people. Um, and then I think um, people have mentors and things as well, don't they, Asim? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think what you said is of key importance. I think, uh, and I wish I'd done this myself once I was sitting in that paper the second time round, because it doesn't take much to ask for help, mm -hmm. but you'd be surprised at how much support other people can offer. And sometimes they can, I mean, they can give you practical support in terms of helping you with coaching and advice on how to pass the exam, but just having someone to talk to about the fact that you're struggling with it. And often the things you struggle with are things far beyond your control. Like you've got stuff going on at home, you know, that makes getting ready for the exam harder and just having someone to bounce that off makes a world of difference, doesn't it? Yeah, and we're all here to support each other, aren't we? We're all, we've all been through it or going through it or about to go through it, you know, so it's good to talk about it. Exactly, and, and just going back to what you said earlier, I agree, like you'd genuinely be surprised which consultants and which regs, we won't name and shame any, yeah. but which one of them, like, which ones of them had to sit those exams multiple times? Because there's no association between your ability to, well, there probably is a degree, but not much association between your ability to pass this paper and your actual day-to-day -day clinical practice. Exactly. And some of like, the most clinically adept regs I've ever worked with have had to do these exams multiple times. It just, it happens. Yeah, um, that's that's exactly what I found out in. So I think... Was there anything else, Stacey? Um, I think that was most of the things that um, came up, I said. I didn't, I, I can't remember any other ones. <laughs> no, but what we did do is we've gone around and we've interviewed um, a bunch of the trainees in the area. So we're just going to play you a list of, of sound bites from them. The, this is some great advice from, from some absolutely fantastic trainees, all the way up to almost consultant level, a couple of them, aren't they? Yeah, Some of them are doing the start exams, <laughs> bloody hell. Um, so just have a little listen in um, to their advice too. So uh, what are your top <laughs> tips for written? Uh, for the written exam, God, the written exam is hard, isn't it? Um, I think probably my top tips would be, if you're one of those people who likes to write out a whole textbook, don't, because it wastes your time. And try and make, try and consolidate everything that you're learning onto like a very small piece of paper, so that then, well, number one, you can take it with you wherever you are and have a look back at it. And number two, you um, don't waste your time. It's different to medical school learning. You kind of know a lot of it anyway, so don't spend your time writing like there are four chambers of the heart. You know that, right? You know what are the main bits of pathology. Try and make tables and lists and pictures and things that are just. A bit different to your normal standard way of, of learning because it's a different style of exam really to what you did at undergrad um, and hopefully and go over it again and again and questions but Sean's going to come on to questions <laughs> questions so it's really in my opinion it's really important to buy a good online exam question bank for example pass test is quite good um, and I would recommend that you do every single question at least once and then if you finish all the questions do them again or buy another exam question bank so I used on examination which I actually found a little bit harder um, so you know you have to be if, if you're if you've done all the questions a week before the exam and you buy another exam bank and you find that they, they're much harder then maybe that's not quite so good psychologically there's another book that's very but uh, there, there's another book that's very good. Um, I think it's out of circulation, so it's quite difficult to get hold of. Um, but it's a chap. Uh, it's, uh, it's a book by a chap called Paul Go, called Pediatric Exams: A Survival Guide, and it's blue in colour, and it's very very good. I'd recommend that. I've got a book recommendation actually, which is basically because I I hate certain things. Like I really don't like endo, and I really don't like renal, and I found that in the MRCPCH like revision guide it didn't really go into stuff in enough no, it basic detail for me who didn't know anything so there's this book that i got out of the library called easy pediatrics by rachel sidwell and mike thompson which has got a really good endo section so if you're really struggling with it have a look there so my my top tip is prepare as much as you need to to feel confident going into the exam but not so much it stresses you out and you're not going to function I think that's the thing for me. Yeah. Is it's all of it, and inevitably what you practice won't come up, mm -hmm. or it'll come up in a different way. So it, the practice really is about getting your mind in the right place. Yeah, not actually about learning all the stuff because 
particularly in, in, in the college exams, you know, it's very, you know, it's very unlikely that you're gonna, necessarily going to be the same thing. Mm. So it's about your head being in the right place. I think uh, practicing with a very good partner like like him uh, makes so much difference. I think that's the top tip for me. Yeah, you that's can't really read, good you can't stay in a cubicle and read so many books and materials. You will not get there. You need to have a, a good partner, mm. practice with, and just like mm. make your brain work. Yeah. Them. I it's think it's a bit more interesting, doesn't yeah. it? Like, yeah, yeah it's a bit soul destroying. I, I, yeah. yeah. I, I, I learned from Tim quite a lot. I, I, I realized that, that I'm, I've got so many mistakes. I didn't really, I wasn't aware of, of them until we discussed yeah. and then we found out. Like, and what, the same with me with the infusions. I think you've got different skills, mm -hmm. you're different kind of to bring to the table, different approaches. Yeah. If you've done different specialties, if you kind of worked in. And we yeah. found that the reality is completely different from the exam. You need to practice yeah. for the exam, not for the, uh, for the actual. Yeah. Hospital. So yeah. sometimes, for example, the sticky thing that you need to write everything by yeah. hand. Um, I think that's it. You, you kind of got to remember that you're also trying to be a good doctor. I, I hate learning things that aren't going to help me in clinical practice. I absolutely hate it. So as much as possible, start with the things that are going to make you a better doctor because that gives you a sense of that you're not just doing it as a tick box, but also to look after the children. If you've, once you've done that, then go on to the bits that you know you need to kind of tick the box. But for me, I struggle to motivate myself if I know it's not gonna actually make me a better doctor. Um, and there's normally so much stuff to cover that you rarely get to the end of the useful stuff before you start getting onto the stuff that's really, you know, so, I mean, I especially think between FOP and AKP, like if I had yeah, learned yeah. the stuff before, gone away, or even like, you know, the renal stuff, the physiology that's in TARS, you learn that. If you go away, I mean, I know that within six months, I would have forgotten it all. And so for me, it made more sense to just smash all the exams. Do it all together. <laughs> <laughs> but then and I also, smash all the I also signed up for AKP card. before I even had my FOP and TARS results, but yeah. you can do that because even if. Mm -hmm. You don't pass it, you can sit them in an order, can't you? Yeah. But I feel like that would highly stress some other people out. Yeah. So that's you but, that's, but it's pop tips from you, so. Yeah, other people, you know, I know other people are like, no, I want to do one a year. Exam questions are the most helpful thing, because that's the way you're assessed on the day, isn't it? So yeah. You don't need to be able to talk about something for half an hour, you just need pattern recognition for the type of questions that they're going to ask you the key things that they want you to know and then be able to answer a multiple choice question. You don't need to be able to write an essay yeah. on a topic. So I guess that slightly alters the way you learn about it as well. If you can avoid it, don't elect to revise when it's sunny. Mm. Elect when it's raining and dark. There's nothing better to do. That's great. We just wanted to thank all our contributors there. So from the top we had Sophie Constantinou, Sean Williams, Tim Warlow, Bassam Al Husseini, and Camille Roberts. Uh, they're all trainees in Wales currently, and they did a great job giving us some extra hints and tips there. So, if you would like to request a topic for us to discuss in a subsequent episode, you can do this via Twitter at dragon underscore bites. Bites is spelt with a Y or email, email us at dragonbitespodcast at gmail.com and then we'll have a vote every month uh, for what you'd like to listen to next. So yet again, we just wanted to thank everyone who contributed to this episode. I just want to give a special thank you to Stacey. And to you, Asim. <laughs> Cheers. Um, and a, a thank you to Iso Sleazy, who does our music for us. So uh, please join us again next time. Thanks for listening to Dragon Bites. Yes. You did swear as well, by the way. What did I, I say? Bloody. Bloody hell. Yeah, that's fine. You right? can't say bloody hell. You can totally bloody... say bloody hell. <laughs> I think bloody hell is an acceptable really? thing. I haven't dropped the f bomb. I was so ready to drop the f bomb. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could totally get away with bloody hell. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're not teaching like three year olds. <laughs> <laughs>